I want to take this opportunity to thank you for coming in out of that glorious spring day that we have outside uh, to talk about uh, a really complex and important aspect of health policy, that is to say, uh, biosimilars. Um, on behalf of Senator, Rock uh, Senator Rockefeller in retirement, <laughs> Senator Cardin and Senator Blunt and our board of directors, I want to welcome you to this program and thank you for coming. Um, it is, um, uh, we, we, we are here to take a, uh, at least an initial look at one of the most um, interesting and complicated policy issues that the Alliance has tackled anyway, uh, and that is uh, the introduction of biosimilar pharmaceuticals in the United States. Uh, there's a statutory framework for bringing biosimilar pharmaceuticals to market. Now the Food and Drug Administration has actually approved one for use, but there's still a lot of open policy questions that uh, remain for policymakers and those who communicate with them to understand and grapple with. And we have brought together, I think, some of the, some of the best authorities uh, on this subject to share their expertise and to respond to your questions. Um, we, uh, uh, we are pleased to have as partners today uh, Amgen and Hospira. Uh, they're jointly sponsoring this discussion. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, they, they, they constitute an unusual mixture of uh, viewpoints because on the one hand, uh, Hospira, whose name you may not be as familiar with as with some other names in the industry, uh, is a leader in biosimilars, uh, both here and around the world, particularly in Europe. Uh, but they are about to be acquired by Pfizer, which is a much broader and uh, more conventional pharma company. I don't mean to use that term uh, derogatorily. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Am Amgen is best known as a uh, conventional pharmaceutical company, again, not in a negative sense, uh, but they have developed a particular interest and activity uh, in biosimilars. So uh, keep that in mind as the, as the, dis as the discussion goes forward. Um, now, the logistics are similar, if you will, to some of the ones that, uh, some of the briefings that you may have attended in the past. That is to say, uh, there are a lot of good pieces of information in your packets, uh, including biographical information on all of our speakers, to whom I apologize for not being uh, more fulsome in my description when I introduce them. There uh, will be a webcast available next week, um, actually maybe Friday, on our website, allhealth.org. And a few days after that, a transcript at that same location that you can take a look at. Uh, some of you may know, because you're already watching it, that we are embarking on a new endeavor for the Alliance that is a live feed of this briefing uh, that is available um, at, uh, and I'm not sure whether there is a link on our website uh, that you can tell the folks that you're in communication with uh, to, to click on or not. Is that right? Right. So you can go to our website if you are communicating with others who aren't here, and there will be a link to the webcast. Presumably you don't need to be watching the webcast on your laptop while you're uh, st sitting in the room eating your lunch. Uh, you can see the hashtag that has been set up for this briefing, uh, biosimilars, and you and uh, the folks watching the uh, live webcast could tweet a question if you wanted 
uh, by using that hashtag, and we'll be monitoring the Twitter traffic. Um, I'm sorry. A little bit closer to the microphone. Sure. Well, you know, I'm new at this, so <laughs> I apologize for not being as audible as I could. Uh, th there are other ways to ask questions when the time arises. Uh, uh, there are microphones that you can use to ask your question orally. There are green cards that you don't have to tweet. You just have to write on them and hold them up, and the low-tech version will be brought forward, and we'll try to address those questions. Uh, as I said, we have a terrific panel um, for you today. We're going to start with Amanda Bartelme, who's the director of consult, uh, uh, who is a director at the consulting firm of Al uh, Avalier. Uh, next to her is Sally Howard. She says we're no relation, and I can understand why she would say that. <laughs> she is an associate commissioner at the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, Sumant Ramachandra is a vice president and chief science officer at the aforementioned Hospira. And next to him is Jeff Ike, who is the div uh, director of external affairs for Amgen's uh, biosimilar operation. So uh, we have, I think, a terrific opportunity to learn. Uh, we've asked our panelists to uh, be monosyllabic and not monoclonal. Uh, in their description of the subject matter, uh, and we're looking forward to uh, uh, a good briefing on biosimilars, and we're starting with Amanda. Excellent. Thanks, Ed. Um, to get started, I was given the daunting task of about nine minutes to give a full overview of what we're going to talk about today, so I will do my best. I'm going to defer a lot of the more technical issues to some of my colleagues here on the panel. Um, but the first question is, what is a biologic product? What are we talking about here today? I think the important distinction here is that we're not talking about, to the right here, the small molecule drug, which is a very small molecule, obviously, a little bit more simple. Um, a biologic product is a med medicinal product that comes from living organisms and tissues. And for purposes of our discussion today, and when we're thinking about biosimilars and sort of juxtaposing with small molecule generics, that drugs that we're probably more familiar with, for my non-scientific um, self, I probably took, you know, chemistry for poets in college kind of thing. And for others in the room who might not be steeped in, uh, you know, biochemistry and things, I think of the processes in, in a small molecule world, it's more of a recipe. I can give you a recipe for chocolate chip cookies, probably everyone in this room can make it. You get the right ingredients in there, you come out with the right product. Producing a biologic product is more about the process. Think of yourself as more of a French pastry chef, that if you don't have the technique right, your end product isn't going to be the right thing. So that's how I kind of distinguish these things in my own mind um, in remembering why, you know, to date we haven't had biosimilars or follow-on biologic products because they're more complex, because it's more difficult um, to make, and there's a lot more that goes into it. So that is my very simple explanation that I think some folks on the panel will be able to <laughs> expound on. And what kinds of products are we talking about here? Um, these are inline products in the US, medicines that are being taken by millions of Americans. Um, and there's some examples here of things that are approaching or have gone off patent. So in terms of what sort of bio biosimilar products can we see in the near future, this is what we're looking at. Um, they treat a range of conditions, oncology, supportive care, uh, uh, inflammatory diseases, uh, just a whole range of issues, but they're used across a lot, uh, a lot of patients. Um, also represents quite a bit of um, money in the U.S. healthcare system right now, roughly about $70 billion of product we think are going to be going off patent um, by 2017. While biosimilars are new to the U.S. market, they are not new globally. This is just an example of uh, the products that have been approved and are already on the market in Europe and other places in the world, and Sumant can speak more to this later since his company is, is well into this space. Um, but just to give you um, some background and to know that these products are being used around the world in other, other countries. We just don't have any um, in the market on the U.S. In the, on the market in the U.S. to date. We have had the first approved and should be coming to market soon, but this is, while it's relatively new in the U.S., there's been much experience in patient lives over around the world. So the reason we have this pathway is because of the ACA and the BPCIA, which established 
um, the authority for FDA to approve biosimilar products, which was, did not exist before. And so I just wanted to walk through quickly what we know from the language in the law and what are some of the remaining questions. And I think those are some of the things we'll be addressing today as a group, um, hopefully, to the best that there are answers. Um, there's terminology in the, in the ACA that a product can be biosimilar and then that a product could also be determined to be interchangeable. Um, the one thing that's still unclear, and I'm not going to put Sally on the spot for this, but how interchangeability will be determined is, it remains to be seen. So that's, that's one issue that's sort of outstanding. Um, and again, so the, the FDA has been given authority to prove a biosimilar and to determine if it is interchangeability. And again, we're learning more about what this process looks like. There's been more guidance coming out from the agency. And since we have had a first product approved, we know more about what that looks like. And also, Jeff and Sumant can talk about that as well, since their companies are going through these processes now with the agency. Um, coding and payment, which is really sort of my area of expertise. I work on the reimbursement and market access side of things. Um, there is specific language in the law that talks about for biosimilars that are delivered by a healthcare professional, so Medicare Part B, um, something that's an infused product in a physician's office, is going to be paid, and excuse me for getting technical, at its own ASP or average sales price, which is a reported metric, plus 6% of its reference products ASP. I know that's a lot to process. We can get into that a little bit later. But what that does is say that there is a very specific payment rate that Medicare must pay for biosimilars under Medicare Part B. And because of that, you really do need a unique billing code to facilitate that. Um, and that's one of the things we expected. We've actually seen this with the first product. Some of the questions that still apply is the way the law is written. Those payment provisions only apply to drugs delivered in the physician office setting. It's not clear if that also applies to the hospital outpatient department. That's been given sort of to CMS to sort out. Um, so as products come to market, we'll see if they decide to make a different policy there. Um, on code assignment, we do know that the first biosimilar to any reference product will be issued its own billing code. What is unclear right now and what we're, we're waiting to sort out is whether or not that code will be shared among many biosimilars to the same reference product. Um, and finally, this concept of interchangeability, which is still getting sorted out, there isn't any clear direction in the law as to how CMS needs to deal with that from a payment and coding perspective. So they may have the authority to make coding and payment decisions for an interchangeable product in the future, but we don't know what that will look like necessarily. Some other pieces here around um, exclusivity for the innovator and the biosimilar, which are fairly straightforward. Um, but we'll move on. I did want to mention quickly that this concept of interchangeability, which was introduced really in the ACA and in the language of the law, is not necessarily a global concept and doesn't follow sort of a scientific pattern that we've seen established um, worldwide. So I think this has been an interesting challenge given to the FDA um, to determine what this looks like and what the standards are because there isn't a lot of, um, you know, as I mentioned before, there are products on the market already in in Europe and other places around the world, so you can draw from that precedence. This concept of interchangeability is not something we have a lot of precedence to draw from, so it's, it's a unique challenge. Amanda, before you go, uh, go on, and I promise you won't get <laughs> penalized in your time, uh, it, it, could you take a moment and just explain what you mean by interchangeability and, and why anyone would care about it? Or do you, I mean, you don't have to do <laughs> Can that. Can we table that question sure, for a moment? Sure, well, no, no, sure. We'll come back to that. I think the concept of interchangeability is that you could switch between the two products, the reference product and the biosimilar, the interchangeable biologic product. You could go back and forth with no discernible um, difference in effect on the patient. Um, and that you could basically swap these in one for the other. So the pharmacist could decide yeah. to do it uh, uh, sort of at his or her own discretion as opposed to going back to the physician? Potentially. Okay. You get into some challenges there with how pharmacy dispensing laws change from state to state. I think it's okay. also important to, to follow up on that to know that the vast majority of biologic products are not self-administered, so they're not things that you're picking up at the pharmacy necessarily and giving to yourself at home. Um, they're drugs and bi they're, they're medicines that are being delivered within a setting of care, so in a hospital, in a physician office. And so the prescribing decision and the decision on what's actually being dispensed and given to the patient is more in the hands of 
the hospital or the provider. So it's not so much you go to the pharmacy counter and the pharmacist can just switch out the product for you. Very good. So CMS has recently put out some guidances on how they are going to treat biosimilar products in various programs, and this gives a, an overview, and we sort of benchmark to either how they treat a branded or an innovative product versus a generic product, or if it's a system that they've developed that seems to be unique to biosimilars. Um, starting with the Part D benefit, so even though I just said most of these products are not going to be self-administered, there are a number that will um, be self-administered and fall under the prescription drug benefit under Part D. Um, and so they put out guidance on for these products, how will they treat something? So for a transition fill, if you're new to a plan and you're on one product and maybe you, you join a new Part D plan and the product you've been on is not covered on formulary, um, how they treat the transition fill requirements is similar to how they do it with innovator products. So they can't switch you from one brand to another without giving an without giving a transition fill. Um, for generics, they can switch. The plan can just have you switch um, immediately. So it's an important distinction. Um, the review process for the far formulary and therapeutics review is the same as we would see with a branded product. Um, they're expecting the same standards and the same review timelines. As uh, the USP coverage requirements are interesting because they're saying that for a biosimilar and the innovator product, they will not count those as two separate products to meet the number requirement for how many products you have to have on formulary. So in that case, they're treating it much like a generic. Um, on the, the low income subsidy cost sharing, this is falling more to the innovator, how they're treating innovator products. Uh, the coverage gap discount program um, so for Medicare beneficiaries who fall into the donut hole, they do not, uh, the, this is actually in the statute, this was not up to CMS's discretion, they are not on the hook for the 50% discount that uh, branded manufacturers are. They're treated the way a generic product is. And we can talk some more about that later if folks have questions. Um, in terms of mid-year formulary changes, also being treated much like a branded product. And protected classes, they were silent on at this point. Um, if and when a biosimilar is approved, that'll be covered under Part D and could fall into the protected classes, I think we can expect to see some guidance out of CMS, but at this point, they've not issued anything. Uh, Medicare Part B, we have, I mentioned this earlier, um, there's specific you know, coding and coverage we think will fall in line with what we see for new branded biologic products in the market, but the payment, there's a separate distinct metric set up for biosimilars. Um, and for Medicaid rebates, which also sets the 340B ceiling price, uh, CMS put out guidance to say that this would be the same rebate amount required of biosimilars as what branded products are being charged. I do have another slide that gives a lot of detail on this, but I'm going to go ahead and skip that. Folks have it in their packet if they want to really get in the weeds, but I will uh, give it to Sally to take over. Oops. Oh, go ahead, that? Sally. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Sally Howard. I'm Deputy Commissioner for Policy Planning and Legislation for the Food and Drug Administration. I, too, am not a scientist, um, but I work with a ton of them, and they've spent a lot of time on um, the many different complex issues that um, come up with biosimilars and interchangeables. And I thought, for purposes of this talk, I would just um, help provide an overview of really the, the regulatory framework that the FDA applies and um, talk through some of the guidances and some of the difficult issues that we're struggling with. Um, so I started out with a what are therapeutic biologics, but Amanda has covered that nicely, and uh, I think that Sumant and um, Jeff will also pick up on that, so I think I can skip over that. Um, understanding that it's um, the biologics are just far more complicated, as uh, Amanda said, than the small molecule products. They are very dependent on process. And so as we look at biosimilars and interchangeables, we're also, and, bio, and the standalone biological pro products, we're very much focused on um, not just the ingredients, as, as Amanda said, but the process um, that's followed. So just a, a quick overview of the product framework. So the what we call originator or reference product comes through the FDA through what's called a 351A pathway. And what this basically means is just like other um, 
new molecular entities, new drugs, they come through and they have to provide the FDA with sufficient data to support that they are um, safe and effective. And so we are looking at, I mean, they have to do the classic phase one, phase two, phase three trials. They're providing the FDA with all the data that we need to make the finding of safety and um, efficacy. And so contrast this to the biosimilar and interchangeable products. Again, similar to Hatch-Waxman and the generic program, they, um, the biologic, biosimilar products are not going through the phase one, phase two. They're not, they're not demonstrating safety and efficacy on their own, but they're rather relating back to the reference product. And so what they need to be able to demonstrate is um, you know, that they are biosimilar to the, uh, the reference product. And so what, what does that mean? Um, so biosimilar and biosimilarity, again, it, it reflects the concept that biological products aren't like small molecule, uh, small molecule products. They are very different. And so where um, with the generics, they must be bioequivalent to their reference product. For biosimilars, they must be highly similar to the reference product because we, again, know that there may be some differences but so long as they're highly similar and there's no clinically meaningful difference, um, the, the department would be able to approve this as a biosimilar. Again, as we look at um, biosimilarity, what we're looking at is um, do they utilize the same mechanism of action? Do they, um, are they going to, they'll be used for the, the same conditions of use um, will be proposed in their labeling as have been previously approved for the, the reference product. They need to have the same route of administration, dosage, form, and strength. And then, again, because of the process issue, we have um, good manufacturing practices that must be um, complied with by the biosimilar product, and we will inspect for that, just as we do for the reference product. Because every time, um, with even the standalone biological product, if they are changing out their process in any way, they need to come back to the FDA. So we have a quality check to make sure that there's no um, inadvertent impact to the uh, safety, purity, and potency of the, the end product. So then how does interchangeability relate to all of this? As, it, as Amanda said, it's a new concept. Um, we will be issuing guidance on this uh, concept of interchangeability. Um, we have it as a slated for 2015, but I will tell you it's, it is very complicated. Um, so for interchangeability, they initially have to demonstrate that they're biosimilar, so um, that they're highly similar and there's no clinically meaningful difference. But they're, unlike biosimilars, they have to provide the FDA with data that supports that um, there's no diminishment in the safety or efficacy of the product if it is alternated or switched between um, the interchangeable product and its reference biological product. And so what that means is, is not just um, that it can be like a one-time switch, but that you could, in theory, move patients back and forth from the interchangeable product back to the reference product, and that there wouldn't be any safety issues related to that. And so um, it's not surprising that, that um, the first products are going to start as biosimilar, and we fully expect that part of that patient experience that is developed will help inform the interchangeability. But um, again, it's... it's um, it's that automatic switching, that ability to do automatic switching that makes interchangeability a very different issue. So um, as Ed and Amanda said, we approved our first biosimilar, um, Zar Zarxio, uh, yeah, Mar March 6, 2015, and this was a biosimilar to Nupagen. Um, we went through an advisory committee and that will likely be a um, part of our, our approval process um, for the Phil Graston product. The, um, it w there was a unanimous decision by our advisory committee, which makes it easy, um, recommending that the biosimilar be approved. So the name that we um, gave to Zarxio, the INN, or um, uh, that, that we provided is a, is a placeholder name, is Philgrastum-Sandos, S-N-D-Z, which is, a, as you might guess, um, a Sandos. Um, it's, it is not intended to be a, a policy, a naming policy, and again, you'll see that we're going to be issuing a naming policy um, later in 2015. So um, 
there's been a lot of interest on the Hill uh, asking FDA, what guidances have you issued? What guidances will you issue? Why haven't you issued more guidances? Um, so I thought that it might just be helpful for this group to understand the final guidances that have been issued uh, to date. The three final guidances uh, were just issued uh, May, uh, end of April, sorry. Um, and then some of the draft guidances that have been issued to date um, are listed on this slide. I'm not gonna read them, uh, with the latest one being issued um, just on May 12th, and they were the biosimilar additional QA document. Of note, guidance is to come. Um, you'll see some of the trickier uh, issues here. We've had a lot of interest um, in the non-proprietary naming for biological products. In fact, I think that uh, Sumant will talk briefly about that issue. Um, the labeling as well, and then technical guidance, the statistical approaches to evaluation um, of analytical similarity data to support biosimilarity, and then the last one is, is likely to be the latest one, and that is interchangeability. Um, a lot of technical scientific issues that will come into play with interchangeability. And then on the non-proprietary naming, um, I, you know, there's, there are just a lot of issues that have been, a lot of comments that we've gotten with very strongly held views on um, multiple sides of the table about what the right name should be. And I would just summarize some of the competing concerns on naming seem to be, um, ease of use, that we not somehow adopt a naming system that, um, that confuses people, that um, at puts the biosimilar at some sort of disadvantage, that allows for safe use and pharmacovigilance. And these are all incredibly important issues for us to consider, and we have been um, thinking through what that right convention would be to, to properly balance all of the concerns that we have heard to date. So just sort of summing up some of the things that I, I hope you can take away from this. Um, again, one of the key concepts is just the difference between biosimilar development and the um, standalone or reference product development being safety and efficacy for the reference product, which is a standalone, and then the biosimilar development being um, a comparative approach that's, that it is bios highly similar to the reference product. And the second concept is that um, as we've been working with the drug development programs and we've been, that, that is our highest priority, I would say right now, is we have been working with a number of um, companies and their drug development programs with, with biosimilar products in the pipeline. We've developed a stepwise approach. Um, basically, the, the most important thing for us is that they be able to establish the structural and functional characterization of the biosimilar product. And the way they go about doing it is really a totality of the evidence approach. We, are, we work with the scientists in the drug development program from the beginning to try to walk them through what, the, what makes the most sense for them. There isn't a one size fits all. Sometimes some of the studies that we've listed here um, may or may not be appropriate, may or may not be needed. And so we have a lot of uh, conversation with them to make sure that the package they put together for us um, can help demonstrate biosimilarity. Another concept to just introduce you to, and then I think, again, um, Suman is also gonna touch on this, is extrapolation. Um, again, we've issued some guidance on extrapolation, and basically what this means is um, you've established biosimilarity for a certain condition of use, and you shouldn't have to demonstrate biosimilarity independently for each other condition of use, so long as you have a, um, you know, so long as there is a scientific justification that lets us extrapolate, we wanna be able to do that. It's gonna be case specific, of course, because, because of the science involved. We um, are we're strongly supportive of the biosimilar and interchangeable market. We think for a whole host of reasons um, that, uh, that it will be, they will be good therapeutic tools um, for providers to use. They will allow competition to happen, which drives down price and makes these products more accessible to everyone that needs them. And so we've just outlined some of the um, external levers that aren't within our control. And then I've just highlighted for you the education and outreach that we're doing. Just terms to become aware of. You know, right now we have what's called an orange book, 
for the biosimilars product, you'll see a purple book, and it basically lists all the products that are biosimilar, the biological products, and the interchangeable products. Um, we hope that this um, quickly becomes as exciting and well used as the orange book. Um, <laughs> And again, uh, we think our, the key role for the FDA is to have a very strong program and to be able to give the public, including providers, the confidence that's needed in these products, that they are as safe and effective as their reference products, that people can be confident that they can rely on them. And we think that in establishing that very strong um, FDA approach, that we will be able to develop the confidence that will be the foundation for a very successful um, biosimilars market. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn now to Sumant uh, Ramachandra. Thank you. Go right ahead. Great. So my name again is Sumant Ramachandra. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of Hospira. Um, just as a way of introduction, uh, Hospira actually has been in the biosimilar space um, since actually from a development perspective since around 2006. We launched our first product in Europe in 2008 uh, with a biosimilar Epoitin, and we've since then launched actually two further products, uh, a biosimilar version of Filgrastim and a biosimilar version of Infliximab, all in Europe. We've also launched uh, drugs in Canada and Australia and recently got approval in Brazil. So we actually deal with both the generic space, the biosimilar sp space, as well as infusion device space, uh, and uh, have uh, uh, employees all over the world that actually work on this particular area. As mentioned before, uh, Pfizer is in the process of acquiring uh, Hospira, and that was announced in uh, February of 2015. Now, um, biosimilars, from my perspective, I'm a physician and a, and a scientist by training, um, Really, biologic drugs as a whole have made a tremendous impact in patients' lives uh, all over the world. It, it's just this new technology that came out decades ago that is clearly continuing to make inroads in many diseases that were very hard to treat. Uh, but as drugs get into the marketplace uh, and exclusivity in the market expires, there has to be an appropriate competition within that market. And competition does really multiple things. And today I'll focus on sustainability of what is sustainable for the healthcare system. What competition does is it drives innovation, but it also drives affordability. And it is that is what the biosimilars uh, area does for the healthcare system. There are very few large levers in the healthcare system to pull to help drive sustainability. But it turns out that the high cost of drugs, once exclusivities expire, is a large lever to pull and can result in cost savings to the patient, individual patient, to the healthcare system and help improve outcomes for these patients. The costs that we're talking about are not in the tens of dollars or in the hundreds of dollars. They're in the tens of thousands of dollars to over a hundred thousand dollars. So when we keep this in mind, when we talk about that $70 billion that Amanda talked about or Clearly, we're pursuing a subset of that in primarily oncology and inflammatory diseases. The significant savings that could occur are very large. So this is our history. Since 2007, the first biosimilar approved to where we are today, which include a simple biosimilar, let's call it simple in the simple terms of Nivestim. It's as simple as it gets from a biosimilar perspective to a bit more complicated one, which is a biosimilar version of Epoitin Alpha, to a monoclonal antibody, which is a biosimilar version of the drug Remicade out there. And what we have seen is that providing high quality drugs in the marketplace, even in markets in, like we're talking about Europe, where they're nationally funded systems, has actually increased patient access and improved outcomes for these particular patients. So you may see a lot of passion from me because I actually have seen the positive benefits of what we have done in Europe and in other markets. Now, these are the markets that we have typically operated in. We're, we're in mostly in the highly developed markets, such as US, Canada, Australia, Europe, and a few other of the emerging markets. But we are pursuing uh, generally around $70 billion of local market value that will expire by 2020. And by the way, I'm quoting to you a number that's from 2012. This market of original biologics are still increasing at about a compounded annual growth rate around 9%. So if you take a base that big and you keep compounding to 9%, you're talking of even larger numbers at the time 
that the market actually expires, that we are pursuing to introduce high quality drugs in a competitive manner. So um, I'm gonna to talk to you about three topics very quickly, naming, appropriate coding and reimbursement, and extrapolation and education. These three topics together create a sustainable marketplace for the long term. So we believe that naming must be simple and intuitive to be effective. In general, the same INN should be applied to the original product as well as the biosimilar product. And an INN is? It's the International Non-Proprietary Name. It's the WHO, the World Health Organization terminology. Some people in the US call it USAN. If you do change and have distinguishable names, it's not a non-proprietary name anymore. It's individual to the particular product. But you know, we, we, that, that's an ongoing process that the FDA is working through. Um, appropriate coding and reimbursement. We support very thoughtful and science-based approach to setting unique reimbursement codes for biosimilars. Biosimilars are not generics, and that's a key point that you'll hear all across the board. And you have to treat this category different than you treat generics for a variety of reasons, not just the cost of development, but the uniqueness of how biosimilars are developed as compared to the original products lets you, uh, allows you the space to say that these are different than generics, uh, as has been mentioned before. And extrapolation, the, the FDA has taken a very positive step in the first approval for giving this extrapolation to the first biosimilar. It's a case on case by case basis, but extrapolation is a single most important tenant for sustainability of development for biosimilars. Why is that? If you have to repeat every single test that the original molecule had to repeat, it costs you more and more and more to develop. The market becomes unsustainable, and frankly, people won't go and, and develop competition into this marketplace. So we also then need to drive from that awareness at the patient and provider level, because extrapolation is a concept that has been around for a long time. It's used by the original companies when they make manufacturing changes, but in this field of biosimilars, there's a lot of confusion. What does extrapolation mean? So I'll, I'll dive into this very quickly, okay? Here are two products. One is our Nivestim in Europe, and in the bottom is Amgen, my colleague sitting next to me, Nupogen in, uh, in Europe. They're both Filgrastims in Europe. They're both actually called Filgrastims. They have unique brand names. They actually have different batch numbers because Amgen has its batch numbers for its particular product. We have our batch numbers. They have different artwork. They have different elements that you can actually recognize the particular product. And the pharmacies in Europe as well as the US keep track of actually what has been dispensed to the patient, whether it goes through an outpatient pharmacy for self-administration or through infusion centers or hospitals. So in general, what we have seen is that you can actually track the product with the same INN, okay, and you don't compromise pharmacovigilance. And so this is a concept that actually is important to recognize that INN can stay the same for the, for the biosimilar as well as the reference product. Now, the next, topic is coding and reimbursement. We have to make sure that we don't just work hard on getting to approval, but we actually go get approval and then make it sustainable in the marketplace. So the market dynamics are very important. We believe that grouping all of the biosimilars under a single J code or blended reimbursement will actually create a disincentive to invest in this crucial area of medicine. I think we will see that as a unique theme across folks is that here on the table is that they should have different J codes, okay, to ensure that each of these biosimilar products, because they are not generics, continue to actually operate into the marketplace and in a sustainable manner. And then the third topic is extrapolation. In the fields of extrapolation and naming, I've put two policy papers out there on behalf of Hospira. They are available publicly. But I wanna uh, make note that extrapolation is a concept that has existed for a long time. We extrapolate day to day in medicine. As a physician, I don't have all the data of a particular patient. In fact, that patient may not even be reflected in the clinical trial fully that was done. So I extrapolate from scientific and clinical knowledge to treat a patient. Now, in the field of drug development, we actually take data and extrapolate it on a day to day basis, okay? If it's scientifically rigorous and justified, you should be able to approve a biosimilar drug for all the indications as compared to the reference product, if the right rigorous testing was done on the biosimilar product. And I have to say, a plug for the FDA, we have interacted with the FDA for a long time in this field, very high quality discussions, 
guidance documents at a very high level. It comes down to the individual case-by-case -case basis discussion between a sponsor and the FDA to drive a program forward and to drive that. And then the pyramid was shown, so I'm not going to belabor it, but this totality of evidence concept is very important to recognize. By the nature of biologic drugs, there are going to be subtle differences between a biosimilar and a reference product. The key thing is to show that these differences do not manifest in clinically meaningful differences. And so you have to take the evidence in toto to determine whether it's a biosimilar, and that lays with the FDA, but a sponsor such as us have to provide them the needed data to get them there. So extrapolation is a key concept. It's been around for a long time. It's utilized by original drugs. It will continue to be utilized by both biosimilars and original drugs. But a lot of education is needed to actually drive people's understanding of this concept. Again, biosimilars are not generics. They're far more complex. They take longer to develop. We are a generic company as well as a biosimilar company and we have developed proprietary drugs. It takes about three to five years to develop a generic drug at around $5 million maximum. It takes up to eight plus years to develop a biosimilar drug with up to 100 to 200 plus million dollars. And on top of that, you have to have capital investments. So you have to actually create a marketplace that actually sustains that level of competition so that you can reinvest in the R&D pipeline to bring more and more biosimilar versions of drugs out there. I will also proudly say, compared to five years ago to now, Companies such as Amgen and Hospira work together to really sustain this field and moving it forward. Even though we have come from very different ways, a long-standing biotechnology company in Amgen, a generic company in Hospira that's been in the biosimilars field for a long time, we're actually working together and we have formed a forum called the Biosimilars Forum to help advance some of these concepts that we will have some differences of opinions on, but if we can get to a better ground and drive to a sustainable market, that's the end goal of what all of us are going to hope for. Lastly, biosimilars give a great promise to American patients and, pay and providers and payers, but we have to actually s settle these three topics, naming, appropriate coding and reimbursement, and then extrapolation and education associated with this emerging field of biosimilars, which will make an impact for American patients for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Saman. We turn to Jeff. Great, thank you. So I'm Jeff Ike. I work uh, for Amgen, which is one of the biotech pioneers. We helped found uh, the biotechnology, medical biotechnology industry in California, which as you guys know, this is a uniquely American uh, creation, the, the biotechnology industry, and it's now expanding worldwide. Uh, and that's actually a very exciting space. Just to, a couple of things to start with. Uh, uh, the two words, Amgen and biosimilars, in close proximity to each other probably uh, have some people asking questions. Why would a company like Amgen enter the biosimilar space? And I think what we realize is that biosimilars do have a role to play in healthcare, that it is important to have a high quality, sustainable, um, patient-focused biotechnology and biosimilars program in a country. And it's also vital to be able to have innovation in new medicines. Uh, you have to be able to create headspace for those new medicines. And so this is actually a very positive development in the evolution of biotechnology. You're seeing the technology spread around the world. And ultimately, we're doing this with the focus on expanding our ability to help patients, help patients in different countries, help patients have access to the medicines they need earlier, and have them be able to access the medicine completely through their course of therapy. So done right, this is actually a material opportunity. I'm also going to preempt one question, which is people frequently ask, we are not making biosimilars of our own brand biologic medicines. We are making biosimilars of a portfolio of nine medicines that are other people's brand medicines, in addition to developing um, innovative therapies. So let me just start here, and with apologies to the folks on the, on the webcast, who in the room can think of three applications, confident you can think of three applications for biologic medicines in healthcare? And I promise I won't call on anybody. Let me see just a show of hands. How many people are thinking they have a good sense of at least three applications? Okay, good. That's a good place to start. So you think about medicines that we use frequently, ibuprofen, um, aspirin, et cetera, and then you can also then think about some of the biologic medicines that you've probably heard a lot about, growth hormone, 
uh, became a biologic medicine. Many of these were originally purified and then became uh, recombinant DNA uh, medicines. And the beginning of this process was figuring out that you could take a living cell and you could program that cell's genetic composition to make a product of interest. And the early biotech medicines replaced what should have already been in a healthy patient's body. If you move to the right, you see where Amgen is focused in its biosimilar program. And this magnificent creation is actually the natural weapon of a human immune system. It's how the immune system goes after problems in a body. And what we've recognized as a collective community of academia, of industry, regulators, et cetera, is that these medicines can be genetically engineered to replace what's in the body, but also to do very specific targeted jobs in a patient's body when their immune system is not doing what it should do. And so examples of where biologic medicines are used are insulins for diabetics, growth hormones for children who are not growing at the appropriate rate, monoclonal antibodies like Humira that can treat rheumatoid arthritis, uh, psoriasis, and also diseases of the, of the gut. The, you've got medicines now used in oncology that can help interfere with the process of breast cancer, of colorectal cancer, lung cancer, and others. So this is what we're, this is the world that we're entering. And we're gonna focus on the most complex medicines and we want to ensure that we can bring high quality, reliably supplied biosimilars of those medicines to US patients. So where I'm gonna go for the next maybe five minutes is give you a snapshot, not into where we've been, because I think everybody knows where we've been. We've passed a law, the FDA has implemented the law, we've put together the large portion of the framework around that law, and the first biosimilar product has been approved in the US. And now the question is, okay, so how does society actually get the benefit of biosimilar medicines? How's this actually gonna work in US healthcare? And you have to start that question with an understanding that each biologic is its own medicine. It's its own medicine. Our version of a particular brand product is gonna be ours. Sumance will be theirs. There's gonna be a number of ways that you can tell the difference between any biologic medicine. And so you can think of biologic medicines as each having slight differences in the structure of the medicine, the active or drug substance. They'll have variation in the formulation, the, 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 the fluid in which the, the medicine is injected into the patient's body. They can have differences in container closure, devices. There are many different ways for biosimilars to have distinguishing features from each other. And as a great example, in Europe, there are a number of biosimilars of one of the early medicines, EPO. And Sumant's company, as an example, invested in their biosimilar and actually has different additional indications of use and routes of administration compared with another biosimilar medicine. And so when you think about this diversity and you understand the space that these medicines are used, um, as we've said, primarily in hospitals and in clinics, they're administered by healthcare providers. There are some that are used in a patient's own home. What you can see is that this diversity among biologics, it does have actual implications in terms of policy. How are these medicines to be coded, right? How do we actually ensure that the coding of the medicines gets to an individual product specific level and not only a group level? We want data to be able to be aggregated and pooled when it's appropriate and disaggregated when it's appropriate down to an individual product. How should the medicines determine whether there's an interchange, whether there's an ability to have two biologic medicines alternated or switched? One important question is, where does that matter most? Is it important for an infused breast cancer medicine to be interchangeable and have patients going back and forth? Or actually, is the societal benefit achieved when hospitals have multiple sponsors and manufacturers making multiple versions of that product competing? And is that the societal objective? You can think about naming. How will the name actually reflect the diversity of the biologic medicines at the actual structural level? And then for states where the practice of healthcare is regulated, how should those medicines be used? What is the importance of a patient's medication history to be able to have accurate adverse event reporting and ensure that each manufacturer can be accountable for their own product? So we've talked a little bit about 
the differences between generics and biologics, and I agree with Simon, and I'll just echo that this is likely to look in the U.S. over the next five years, certainly, like a branded space. And the reason is that each of these medicines has their own set of, of features and attributes and data sets and development uh, decisions that were made by the sponsor. And ultimately, our objective is to compete with each other for the best value for the healthcare community, that patients will receive a benefit, that physicians receive benefit, that their patients are receiving their medicines at the right time and with the right period of use, and that the healthcare system is also benefiting from increased competition. This is a well-designed pathway. It's a well-designed program and done the right way. It will be very, very successful. So I want to close out with really just four points that we think as we observe the biosimilar program in the U.S., where it's going, and hopefully our contribution to its success, four points that are absolutely vital. The first is the goal. The patient and physician confidence in biosimilar medicines is vital. And the reason for that is, is that patients and physicians ultimately have many, many choices. For the biosimilar program in the U.S. to be successful, physicians will have to opt in and patients will have to have a positive experience. And I want to start there because it's vital that we get physicians the data they need, that we're fully transparent about the data, that they have high confidence in the quality of the medicines, and that they know that they'll be reliably supplied. The regulatory standards are vital, and the reason for that is shortly after FDA approves any biosimilar medicine, academic treatment centers like MD Anderson, Memorial Sloan Kettering, Geisinger Health System, and others will begin to do side-by-side -side assessments. We've heard this from any number of consumers, that they will actually want to evaluate the biosimilar medicine and the brand medicine head-to-head -head in the post-market setting. Our biosimilars have to withstand that level of scrutiny. And so that really is the true test, is that the healthcare community builds and maintains confidence in these medicines. It's vital that we find ways to have all of the relevant information that a physician needs to make a treatment choice for her patient conveniently and accurately and in its entirety provided to her. There is a wealth of information on biosimilar development of medicines, the data sets, whether they be analytics, pharmacology, or clinical data that is available to the physician and we need to ensure that they're able to have the data to make an informed choice. We have choices in terms of how we drive single point accountability and by single point accountability for medicines quality, I mean that a company like Amgen, a company like Hospira and others can make the choice to invest in quality for their individual manufacturing plants, facilities and others. That begins with knowing that you can be accountable all the way through patient use for your individual medicine. We have the opportunity in the choices that we make around naming, around coding and others to ensure that each manufacturer can be accountable for the quality of their medicine and can stand accountable to the patients that we serve. We need to make every effort to ensure that that persists as biosimilars enter the U.S. market. And finally, it's vital that we work together, and this is where the Biosimilar Forum that Sumant mentioned has taken 11 companies from very diverse backgrounds and begun to focus along with academia, regulators, others to say how do we work, not just in the U.S., but even potentially worldwide, to ensure accurate, non-biased, participatory education so that healthcare providers have a baseline understanding of biosimilars before considering individual products. If we do these four things right, we will achieve the goal of patient and physician confidence, and that is exactly where Amgen's biosimilar program is focused for the success of the U.S. program, most certainly. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, okay. This is a lot to cope with, <laughs> and uh, you should feel free to ask questions at any level. As again, I, I mentioned to you, there are microphones, there are green cards, and if you're tweeting to hashtag biosimilars, we'll be monitoring it to bring a question you submit in that manner forward as well. Uh, and let me just start, if I can, while the machinery is starting to crank, uh, to just make explicit why this discussion is happening, if you will, why it's important. Uh, and 
a couple of you have alluded to it. What we're talking about here is the potential for substantial savings over the projected drug costs that are now in the, in the pipeline. And I wonder if that's a, uh, what's really driving the development of biosimilars and the extent to which we're able to foresee the magnitude of that impact. So I, I, I can start, if, uh, and then I, I'm sure the others can also. Um, so savings is one part of the equation. I think that the companies you're talking about here, Amgen, Hospira, the people you're talking about at the table, the FDA, Avalier, um, we um, really care about patient and patient outcomes. Okay, I think it's very important to not forget that. Savings is one aspect to help increase access. Access helps improve outcomes, and that's where the equation lies. So while there's a lot of interest in the US, it's because exclusivities are starting to expire this year all the way through 2020 something, okay? And that is worth billions of dollars. So of course, naturally, competition will go after that. But in the end of the day, if we don't forget that these medicines we're creating do go, do go into people, uh, we'll lose sight of why we did this. And in the end of the day, we want outcomes to be better, and we want high quality medicines to exist in our marketplace to drive those better outcomes. Okay. And uh, I was actually struck with something on one of Sally's slides that she didn't make a re direct reference to, which is that 40% of total drug spending is on biologics or thereabouts. And this, this certainly doesn't come from the FDA. This comes from Express Scripts, who in a number of their um, slides and presentations uh, quoted the 40% number. And, you know, but they are, it, it is, I believe, but would turn it over to Amanda because I, I am not a, uh, an expert on reimbursement or the costs or the expense. But, um, I mean, I, I think as others have alluded to, it's one of the highest growing um, areas. Yeah, that's definitely right. And I think to Ed's points earlier, I think the cost savings is a major driver and one of the things that payers are really looking forward to as they're struggling with their budgets. And they're paying for biologic products now because to points made, these are really important tools to help patients um, manage a variety of diseases. So they're looking forward to, and I think from a consumer standpoint too, competition is good. It will bring prices down. It will bring out-of-pocket costs for consumers down. It'll help um, health plans expand their, you know, stretch their budgets further to serve more people. Um, and I think there's another piece of this is we were talking about the, um, the difficulty or the, the complexity of manufacturing some of these things. Getting more participants in the space actually can expand the market as well and make sure that there aren't shortages or that you can s keep up with the demand for these products. So I think that's another point that we don't want to miss, that it's not just about the savings, but it's about meeting overall demand and having more players is a good thing. Okay. Uh, yes, let's go to microphones. I, I would appreciate it, and I know our panel and the rest of your colleagues in the audience would appreciate it if you would keep your questions as brief as you can uh, so that we can get to as many of the questions as we can. We have already a pile of green cards, and please identify yourself with your affiliation if you have one. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Mike Miller. I um, uh, came to health policy years ago and at Hare out of uh, a clinical research lab, and I'm a physician by regional training. And I guess picking up on what Amanda just said, I wondered if the panelists could talk more about the complexity of manufacturing or producing or growing uh, biologics versus small molecule drugs, spe spe specifically uh, how sensitive the process is to getting what you want versus something that isn't what you intended. I can take that one. I mean, I, I can start, I guess we have an interesting perspective having, you know, started early on in the development of, of uh, biologic medicines. One of the questions we had uh, as we were looking at entering the biosimilar space was, would this be sufficiently complicated and challenging such that our scientists who were used to working on cutting edge medicines that no one's ever seen before would find, you know, biosimilar development stimulating? And I think what we found is we've been rewarded, right? We, we thought it would be very complex. It has been incredibly complex. The processes are very, very similar, and there's a number of aspects of, of biosimilar development that 
um, you know, frankly, require a lot of work in the design of the medicine. You, you know, once you, once you find the clone and you can express the medicine with a series of characteristics that you think are, are close to what you've observed, then, you know, that, that's a great place to be because the development is a bit more straightforward. Now, in practice, the more complex the medicine, the more likely we are to see something that's outside maybe what we've observed with the reference product. And in fairness, the reference product sponsors have a lot of history in their medicines that a biosimilar developer doesn't. We, we sit on both sides, so we, we know exactly what that difference is. And then now you're in the space where your development program, you have to answer the question, what's the meaning of the observed difference? I, I think from our perspective, it's vitally important that sponsors use the most sensitive assays to assess whether a difference exists, and then design their programs, both in pharmacology and their clinical testing, to actually highlight the difference if it exists. It's, it's possible, certainly, to create a clinical trial that sort of doesn't necessarily have the capability to show a difference, but that's kind of a pursuit of in, in futility, right? You have to design the right clinical study to answer the question, or you can answer it in pharmacology, but in either circumstance, it's got to be the most sensitive test. We should never pass on to the healthcare community or flip over the fence to the FDA, you know, sort of an unsolved problem. That, that's the job of the sponsor is to put the very best science into it so that we go into that, if you will, road test at, at, at MD Anderson or, 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 or another center with a real sense of confidence in our hypothesis that we're going to have patients experience no difference using the, the biosimilar than they would have if they had used the reference product. So as someone who actually, uh, as a company that makes both biosimilar products as well as small molecules, uh, there are distinct differences. So your point is uh, well taken. You have to develop the science around this from the research and development laboratories. But very importantly, you have to actually have solid, high-quality manufacturing uh, put in place to actually supply the market and sustain the market. And Hospira, from its history, uh, grew by partnership uh, with uh, people like GlaxoSmithKline through the human genome sciences uh, uh, acquisition that they bought, and, and our EPO is going through there. Um, so w where we actually didn't have the internal initial capability, we actually partnered and got that knowledge and capability in through partnership. It's also important to remember that the original drug, and this is well published, uh, there are three seminal papers in this area, if anyone actually cares to take a look. One is by Martin Schistel from Novartis Sandoz. The other one's by Christian Schneider, who is a member of the CHMP of, of the European Medicines Agency. And the third is a recent paper that was published by Martina Weisser um, out of the European experience called uh, the, the Science of Extrapolation. If you take those three papers in combination, you'll kind of understand that, this, that the field of biosimilars did not evolve out of nowhere. The field of biosimilars is based on decades of history of the original drug and the experience that regulators have from the original drug. Little known facts are, for example, extrapolation is used on a routine basis when an original drug makes a change to its manufacturing process. A drug like Remicade, which we have a biosimilar for called Inflectra, that particular drug, at least for Europe, has 30 plus changes, manufacturing changes over its history. And Martina Weiss and, and, and her colleagues that wrote this paper said, don't imagine for a second that the drug that's being used today is exactly the same that drug that was approved okay, 10, 15, 20 years ago. That's not a bad thing. It shows that the life cycle of a biologic drug have to exist in the marketplace, and biosimilar drugs, as well as the original drugs, will continue with this life cycle. And that's an important concept, that this field is based out of years of experience that regulators and scientists and companies have had with the original drug. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Jim. I'm Dr. Yeah. Caroline Poplin. I'm a primary care physician. I want to get back to the question of price. Uh, it seems uh, that in this country, uh, as drugs come out, uh, they're more expensive than the previous drugs, and then all the prior drugs move their prices up so that everyone is getting the same high price. Um, it's, it's not just a problem for biosimilars. Tom Brokaw is out with a book about his multiple myeloma. He's taking Revlimid, lenalidomide, which is a simple molecule, I think, and he's paying $500 a pill, and he takes them twice a day. Um, and that's a simple molecule. To the, to the man from Amgen and the man from Hospira, soon to be Pfizer, another very expensive, 
make a very expensive product. How can we get, we have competition on quality. How do we get price competition going? And, do, and in Europe, where apparently they're ahead of us um, on biosimilars, is there any price competition? Or uh, Americans just can't afford it. And insurance companies so. just put all these medications in high tiers and say, well, if you have cancer and you need medicine, you have a 50% coinsurance. Yeah, maybe you start and then I can just throw it over here. Sure. I think we could spend a whole day talking about just your questions, so we'll try and hit some of the, uh, the high points, but you raise some real, some real important concerns. I think one thing that is a brilliant piece of the way the law was written for the physician-administered drugs is that it actually sets, without explicitly doing it, by the way the payment methodology works for Medicare, it sets a ceiling price for what you could charge for a biosimilar, and there's no business case to charge at the same price, you have to come in below of what the, the innovator is um, to even gain a market advantage or even have a competitive, to, to even be on par. Because your payment rate is tied to the rate of the, the, the innovator product. So I think that's a brilliant part of the law which will ensure on the part B side, on the physician administered side, that biosimilar products will have to come in at or below what the what the innovator price is. So that's locked in. The degree to which we see a discount, whether that's 15%, 20%, 50%, remains to be seen. And I think that's that's the difficult, that's sort of the million dollar question that, that nobody really has a good answer to. But um, we are expecting to see discounts there. And I think when we're talking about things that are this expensive, to your point, $500 out of pocket per pill, per pill um, a 20% discount on that, is a significant amount of money. So even though we're not gonna see the huge percent fall off that we see on the generic side, there is going to be savings in here. But to your point, these are still going to be high cost medications. And that's still gonna be a challenge for payers and for consumers who are gonna bear the brunt of some of this. But hopefully in aggregate, it starts to pull things down. So Hospira as a company has existed in um, a non-monopolistic world almost our entire life. So we compete, that's just the nature of what we do. We do follow one product, that's what generics are and that's what biosimilars are. So what we have seen in Europe is that there is a clear cost reduction. It, it's clear, okay? It, what it depends on is per market. There, Europe is not one country, it's, it's market dependent on the countries. We have seen anywhere from, if you aggregate things, in the 20 to 30% cost reduction, if you compare prior to a biosimilar entry, and if you mature things out, you know, two to three years out, you'll start seeing that reduction. That reduction actually benefits the entire system because that same cost can be applied to increased access or to new therapies, okay? In the end of the day, we do need also new drugs, not just biosimilars, but we need new drugs against new targets that will make further inroads into people's health. And the most important thing that one can do is, first of all, health authorities can assure high quality sponsors are getting approval, but then sound policies have to be in place to ensure that the market is sustainable with competition. And those two things hand in hand will result in a market that actually has sustainability for the long term. And I should say, we, and we were talking earlier about the extent to which there are biosimilar entrants uh, expressing an interest in uh, exploiting that availability of drugs coming off of uh, patent. And I wonder if that is, uh, in your collective experience or expertise, likely to develop in the course of the next few years. I, I Jeff? I, I can take that one. I mean, I, I, I think what's fascinating and a t completely um, optimistic indicator for biosimilars in the U.S. is the level of interest. I think the FTC estimated one to three competitors per molecule, and in the vast majority of cases, we're looking at well in excess of five, and in many cases, in excess of ten competitors per molecule, per brand biologic medicine. So there's a lot of interest. 
there's a tremendous amount of capital investment for Amgen. That investment is well north of a billion dollars in an investment in a portfolio of nine biosimilars and also in a successful U.S. biosimilar program for the reasons that Sumant described. We have to create sustainability in healthcare. Drugs represent somewhere between 15 and, and 18 percent of the total cost of healthcare, and that is not an elastic number, right? And so we're going to have to find ways to be efficient with healthcare and ensure that we serve patients. And there's a lot of ways that biosimilars can play a role, but I think the early indicator is that this, this law, the implementation of the law, has actually been um, well crafted, and we just need to give this a little bit of time, and I think we're going to see a very successful program in the U.S. Yeah, and I, I would agree. We, we currently have, are, are working with 51 biosimilar development programs. And so, I mean, we, we see a very robust pipeline. I mean, they're uh, clearly at different points along the way, but um, we're engaging with a number of companies with a number of programs. Okay. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name's Joe Zorzoli with UCB. I head up public policy for the group. Uh, my question is around labeling. Uh, Zarzio was our first biosimilar approved by the FDA and it adopted Nupigen's uh, prescriber information. So my question is, as Sandoz begins to collect post-marketing survey uh, data, will they have the ability to update that label? We have a labeling guidance that we're getting ready to, to um, I mean, that we have slated for 2015. I, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer that. That's really a cedar specific question, and I'm more of a policy person, so I think it's going to be very dependent on what our folks at Cedar see um, in that marketing situation. If I can just just uh, try to uh, play with your question a little bit, the importance of the question has to do with the uh, allowable uses of the drug, is that right? And the labeling is where that uh, list of uses of, uh, is available. I, I think that, I think indications that's partly right, but the, the other part of the question would be around adverse events and things like that if they differ from the originator product. And so how would uh, the, the maker of the biosimilar update um, th those type of differences? And, and I would have to kick that back to our folks at Cedar. I'm sorry. Okay. Jeff? I can just add a little bit here. I, I think one of the things that's going to be really important to um, early adoption of biosimilars is going to be credible, transparent data. And, uh, you know, different than generic drugs, there is a lot more information created in the development of a biosimilar. That's what takes that, you know, 250 million and, and eight years. And to the extent that that information can be made available to providers is going to be really determinative in terms of how willing they are to use these medicines. You can think about some of these medicines being used in, in curative cancer settings. There is data available. We have to find some way to appropriately put the data out in a way that, that people have access to to make an informed choice. It would, it's it sort of, you know, it, you also can anticipate a world in which a biosimilar study uh, that's head to head with a reference product, you know, gives you very accurate information that, that will answer some providers' questions, and there's got to be a way for that information to be made available. So from our perspective, we've actually been quite uh, vocal about this. Even if the, the overall label ends up being the same, there has to be a mechanism for the, uh, the basis of approval, i.e. the data that you generated in each step of the comparison pathway for biosimilarity uh, is made available, whether it's through publications or the ability to promote it, okay? So those are things that obviously the FDA is working through. We have shared our opinion, but the reality is there is the original drug with the original label. There's a f biosimilar that comes onto the marketplace that has a basis of approval of what it was based on. So that has to also be out there in one form or another. And there are mechanisms uh, to make sure that they are available appropriately, good mechanisms that the FDA does allow. And, and gentleman's question actually suggests a couple of the questions that have come up on cards that I wanted to, to surface for uh, you folks. And that has to do with the, the uh, uh, continued monitoring post-FDA uh, post approval of the efficacy and uh, safety of, of biosimilars, or for that matter, biologicals in general, given what has uh, been pointed out several times that these entities tend to change subtly over time. So 
maybe it's not exactly the same product, how are you going to assure that uh, th that that uh, uh, the efficacy and safety remain? And the other question had to do with the same subject, and asking whether there is an answer out of the European experience that's different from what you expect here. Well, and I'll start with this. I'm sure others will have views too. But um, pharmacovigilance, which is the the monitoring of safety of the products, FDA does this in two ways. We have um, we have a Sentinel system, which is actively surveilling, and we look at claims data, and we're we're very actively looking at how products are are working, and whether there are adverse events. And then there is what we call passive uh, surveillance, which is when there are adverse events, people report to us. And I'll start with the passive, the, some of the flaws with passive surveillance is, especially in the generics world, which we would kind of look to, many times the, the report is made actually to the reference product. They're not, it's not reliably made to the, to the um, actual generic product. So it's sometimes difficult for us to tell the precise product that was used that caused the adverse event. And in the um, in active surveillance, some of the, the complexities that we have with our Sentinel system, which is a terrific system that is constantly mining like millions of, of um, health systems or records, um, the complexity there is that there's not a real, there's not a standard format used necessarily. And so, um, when when we're trying to do pharmacovigilance, and from our perspective, it's if there's a problem. I mean, we're looking to see if how fast can we find which product caused the problem, so we can address it very quickly, so we can minimize the scope of the recall. Um, and and so that's the one thing is let's say there is a problem. And the second thing is we want to. We want to be able to understand over time the safety profile of the biosimilar versus the reference product versus an interchangeable product. And so as we uh, look at a number of the policies that are being discussed now, just that's foremost in our mind is, are we going to be able to track back? Are we going to be able to really understand the safety profile of, the, of each of these products? And some of the challenges we have are, you know, unlike the, um, where the NDC code is used, all the time in the pharmacy benefit side. It's not used in the physician um, and hospital setting. So that's where you get to J codes. And, and so how are we going to be able to track through the J code versus the NDC code and what settings these products are used in all, all make for a very complex policy problem to be solved. From a European perspective, um, we, we have uh, launched these three products. We, we could only take the, uh, a look at two of our products that had been long enough in the marketplace, uh, Epoitin and Filgrastim. And then our, our data was actually uh, confirmed, let's say, in, in numbers by what uh, Novartis did when they looked at their experience. And then European database for safety, you, the Eudora database actually collects this information. In general, uh, it's around 90 plus percent of uh, cases can be identified uh, in Europe. For us, it was 95 and 99 on the two products. I think Sandos had it, Novartis Sandos had it also in the 90s. And uh, the European database, uh, this is, which is run by the health, uh, European Commission Health Authority, their EMA actually was 90%. Uh, so it's a very high number, um, but the uniqueness in Europe in general is that there is brand name prescribing in most of the markets. So in general, you do know uh, what's gonna happen. In the US, you know, th there's not an absolute requirement requirement for brand name prescribing. Um, so it may be slightly different from a dynamic perspective, but in terms of European data, 90% and north. So I would just add a couple of things. You know, one of the things we want for Amgen Biosimilars is to absolutely be distinguishable in code, in name. We, we want to ensure that we can actually get the report on our medicine. And, you know, the other side of the numbers, and we know this have, having also been a brand biologic sponsor, is that a large proportion of reports that do come in from patients, physicians, pharmacists, they don't have accurate identifying information of the manufacturer. So they are investigated and they're filed and they become, if you will, sort of class adverse events. They're, they're, they're some, somehow related to the class but not to a product. We will never do that to another sponsor and more importantly, we will never do that to a patient. We wanna ensure that every single concern with our product results in a phone call to us so that we can do the investigation, do the due diligence, understand why that problem has occurred. We also don't want our problems, if we were to have an issue, to be seen as a broader class problem because you could actually 
hurt patients that way in the sense that, as Sally said, if the recall is larger than it needs to be, then that's actually hurting patient care. And so from our perspective, this is very simple. Just do the right thing, have single point accountability for your medicines, brand or biosimilar, and let's focus on the patient and let's focus on ensuring that clinicians have confidence to use these medicines, patients have a good response, and we can get to the part which everyone's waiting for, which is the societal benefit. I've got a question here that requires me to ask a threshold question. Uh, and it, it involves uh, J codes. And my question before I ask this one is, what the heck is a J code? I can take, I can take that <laughs> one. She's Amanda. Amanda. I'm the resident coding geek. <laughs> so J codes are a form of HICPIX code or the Healthcare Common Procedure Coding System <laughs> codes. Um, <laughs> if anyone is that, you know you see those ads that say you can become a medical billing and coding specialist. People need to learn about six different sets of codes that describe services, products, all different things that we put on claims um, for medical care. And J codes are used for drugs and biologics delivered in a physician office or hospital outpatient department. So infused drugs and intramuscular injections and other things. So not oral drugs, not things you're taking yourself, with a few exceptions, I should caveat that. But these are, it's the, it's the billing code used in those settings of care and the code identifies the product, so then the product can be paid. Okay. As Bill Cosby once said, I asked you that question so I could ask you this question. <laughs> uh, you mentioned biosimilars should, uh, should have separate J codes. Uh, the U, I'm not sure. All of us, yes. all of us, all of us agreed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but what about interchangeables? Uh, shouldn't interchangeables have the same J code as the reference biologic? And I, I guess I should, clarify that it's my understanding that this is a theoretical question because there are no such things as interchangeables as defined in the statute at this point in time. There's no approved interchangeable right. 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 Okay. Anybody want to take a crack at that? Should they have the same J code? Sure. I mean, if I we ever have start. one? Uh, I'm happy to start. I, I think that, you know, Sally pointed out the, the HICPIX code or the J code, which simply means the product identifier uh, persists into claims databases. So it means that a patient goes in, sees their physician, they're administered a, a medication, and it is this code that persists into the claims database that provides the, the source. It's the big data for FDA to direct its technology, which is called Sentinel, to connect a patient, a product, and an outcome, hopefully a good outcome. Any time any biologic medicine does not have a product-specific code, you're going to see a patient, an outcome, and an amalgamation of products. There's great value and, and need to be able to aggregate data, but we cannot exist in a place where we can't disaggregate data to a specific product. You know, one of the things we're going to learn about biosimilars or that biosimilars will teach us about biotechnology is vastly greater understanding of what these small differences that we see between products actually mean. And Sentinel is probably one of the most sensitive um, assays to, to understand what those potential differences can be. We will do ourselves scientifically a disservice, but most importantly, we do ourselves a disservice by not being accountable to patients if we allow for anything other than the ability for Sentinel get to get to an individual product, an individual patient, and the outcome. And from our perspective, a J-code is a good way to distinguish uh, between uh, all each biosimilar and the original drug. So I think having that ability to distinguish within a J-code is a good way and good good policy sense across the board, regardless of interchangeability or not. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Angela Moss with Specialty Pharmacy News. Um, my question is on the naming issue. So with about 70 biologics right now on the U.S. market that have different brand names with the same INNs, if the FDA gives biosimilars different INNs, would that mean then to be consistent that it would need to go back to those existing products and have them have distinguishable INNs as well? Very good question, and I will tell you it's not the first time we've been asked that question. Um, you know, I, again, I think as we're continuing to sort out what the right policy would be, one of the things that, um, one of the concerns that has been raised to us a number of times is if you, um, if you were to have something that wasn't the same name, 
how should you apply something different and should it apply just prospectively? Should it apply prospectively and retrospectively? Should it apply just to biosimilars? Should it apply um, to all types of biological products? And, um, and again, this, this has, in some of the other questions that have posed are, are things that we're struggling with and why you don't see a naming guidance out yet. I think one of the challenges here too, in, in, with this question and the last question is, we're dealing with unknowns a bit here and we're trying to predict the future and we're thinking about things that are used for very different purposes. We're talking about tracking for pharmacovigilance. We're talking about billing and coding and payment and reimbursement and claims processing. And naming has a, a role in all of those things. Coding has a role in all of those things. But I, I think the question that everyone's grappling with is, does a code have to be all be able to successfully do all of those things? Does a name have to successfully navigate all of the potential pitfalls for with reimbursement, with pharmacovigilance? And I think that's the struggle because it's finding the right balance of how do we have a sustainable market that encourages competition, that encourages high quality products and has patients having access without getting into this morass of technicalities that are bogging it down. So I think that's, I, I think both of those questions kind of speak to that and it's about how do you how do you sort that out and come up with the right framework that everyone can operate under. I mean, I can also answer it from a, a biosimilar perspective. I don't need the reference product to have a change in their name, right? It's not a fairness issue or an equality issue. It's just simply an accountability issue. If the reference product is adalimumab and ours is adalimumab Amgen, or AMGN or whatever else, that's perfectly fine. It just means that one goes directly to the reference product sponsor and one phone call goes directly to us if it's our product. I, I don't think we need to overcomplicate it. What we need is just to be able to say, look, we are standing accountable. We've got a med line ready, med info line ready to answer questions, concerns, issues. If we've got an issue, we're gonna solve it. And therefore, and in their doing, we're getting to the next level, which is, hey, and we really think that this is a compelling choice for you to think about. And if you, but if you are going to, the one distinction is that if you are, if you're going to prescribe something you've known for 10, 15 years and you see something else as different, you wonder if it's different. So if there is going to be a change of policy, our perspective is that it should encompass uh, the field. So if there is a drug X that is going to have this additional qualifier, um, then for as a biosimilar, then you need to look at the original drug and ask the question, okay, is that also needed for that original drug? Because if someone does call in a report, and just uses the word adalimumab and they don't know what else was associated with it. At least if it has that qualifier, you can tell which adalimumab it was, frankly. So if you wanna keep it even and pro-competitive, you should do it for both the original drug as well as the biosimilar. And we're not opposed to that. Actually, we, we welcome that if that's gonna be the path. I, I have what I think is a related question. I'm not quite sure that someone has submitted uh, from Twitter and it has to do with awareness, uh, which was one of uh, Sumant's uh, points, and, uh, and, and the familiarity and comfort level that providers who might be prescribing these uh, would have with biosimilars. And the question is, why is there, such, if there is such a low level of awareness about biosimilars among physicians and patients? So people can speak from different perspectives. So there is, awareness, there's probably misinformation awareness that has to first be cleaned up, okay? That's number one. So there's a lot of um, myths out there about what a biosimilar is that has been propagated over a long time. Then there's actually awareness, what we're talking about, which is that biologic drugs have been critical in treating patients for a long time, and there'll be a lot more biologic drugs that'll be out in the marketplace. So when we talk about awareness, we wanna to move to the positive side and start talking about the benefits of a biosimilar as well as the original biologic and how a very competent health authority looked at the data and gave approval for that and what the post-approval commitments are, what was the basis of that approval. So I think we wanna move the conversation in a positive direction and while there may be awareness, some of the awareness has been in the negative direction. And, and FDA is aware, I mean, we feel a vital role in that as well, that education. I mean, we want to be able to um, help with the educational process as the regulator to be able to stand behind the biosimilars as 
as a valid choice for the patient, for the provider community, and we feel that we really are a vital part of that education. Yep. I would just add a very simple answer. They're brand new, right? I mean, I think that's the, that's the very easy answer is it's new. It's something different than what we've had with brand and generic drugs in the U.S. Education is going to be vital, and that's one of the reasons the Biosimilar Forum was, was created. We're going to try to cram in one last question uh, because there are several uh, that have to do with states that we're not going to be able to get to, but I did want to try to, to squeeze in one. And that actually proceeds from a premise that I would ask the panel uh, to judge the uh, correctness of, and that is that states have been passing automatic substitution laws that require most bi uh, biologics to uh, uh, be changed if there, if there is a biosimilar. Uh, and actually, we have some material in your packet that would point in the other direction, that there are states That's considering right. laws to require notification. Let me just That's clarify. Yeah, okay. w what, first of all, the practice of healthcare is regulated at the state level. And so how biosimilars are used um, is something that is a matter of each state's jurisdiction. Um, what is what is being changed and, and updated are the are the state pharmacy acts in each state mm -hmm. to enable when the FDA determines a product to be interchangeable that the pharmacy may be allowed to substitute. And today under current law there would not be any substitution of biologic medicines. And so all it does is it takes the this the, the existing statute for generic drugs and it in now includes a circumstance in which the FDA has determined a biologic medicine to be interchangeable with another. And it also makes clear that the, the physician retains the ability to have a medically necessary product dispensed, that the record keeping should be the same as is the case for any other medicine in that state. And the one difference is around the communication between the patient's healthcare team. And this is something that the 11 large you know, companies developing uh, biosimilar medicines patient groups, physician groups, PBMs, others have really coalesced around since 2013. And it's an understanding that for these medicines, which persist in a patient's body for weeks, if not months, right, it's vitally important to have an accurate medication history and not just an accurate medication history that's at the pharmacy. Today in the, in the U.S., pharmacists report on average, uh, you know, five or less percent of the adverse event reports that are submitted to manufacturers hmm. and submitted to the FDA. The disproportionate majority are either the patients themselves or physicians or other health care providers. And so the entire intent of the State uh, Pharmacy Act and the only difference between the generic statute that's existing is this concept of an interchangeable product is suitable for automatic substitution and that we want to ensure that the patient's health care team, the patient, the physician, and the pharmacist have equal shared accurate patient medication history. And, and also just that the communication we're talking about is after dispensation, not prior to. And that's an important thing because right. if the interchangeable is de designated by the FDA and a substitution occurs at the pharmacy level, no one is blocking that substitution to occur. But the communication to close the loop with the health care provider the physician who prescribed it is absolutely important to just put all three people in the same loop, pharmacist, patient, physician. Okay. Well, listen, uh, I don't know about you folks, but I have learned a lot in the last hour and a half. And uh, I want to congratulate you on staying with uh, an admittedly complex but uh, potentially very important area of development in the healthcare system. And I want to thank our colleagues at uh, Hospira and Amgen for their participation and their support for this briefing. Ask you to help me uh, thank our panel for taking on a tough subject in a very plausible way. <laughs>